Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Science Fellow and Principal Atmospheric Scientist with Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak with you today about weather risk in production and agriculture across Canada. And we're going to talk specifically about what we saw in 2021, how this fall and winter shaped up so far, and what are the long-range projections for spring and summer, not only here, but we're going to look at a couple other places around the world. But I'm going to start first with something that I find fascinating, and it's the image that's over here on the right. Now, don't look at the animation on the left just yet. You see, the image on the right shows you the annual mean temperature distribution, and here's the issue. When you think about Earth, of course, Earth is round, but because of that, the equator, that region right in here called the tropics, takes in way more direct sunlight and therefore heat than the rest of the planet. And this is what Earth's attempting to do every single moment of its existence. Get that heat to the poles. Get an even distribution of heat across the planet. That is what large planetary systems with atmospheres attempt to do, to equalize. Now, what makes this enormously complicated on Earth is the fact that as the Earth orbits the sun, now look at the image over here on the left, as the Earth orbits the sun, the tilt of the Earth being about 23 and a half degrees on its axis means that throughout some time of the year, the sun's rays are much more direct in the northern hemisphere. And in the other time of the year, they're direct in the southern hemisphere. And that's enormously complicated by geography and like our oceans next to mountain chains, next to deserts and prairies. And constantly the Earth is in this attempt to heave itself into a more comfortable position to get the distribution of heat equal. Now what we end up getting out of it is this, the jet stream. This is the atmosphere's attempt to get itself into an equilibrium. And the consequence of doing that is to create this incredibly fast wind that kind of circumnavigates the planet. And you're looking at it right now, today, way up in the atmosphere, about six miles above our heads, screaming out of Japan and splitting here in the Gulf of Alaska. A northern branch cutting into British Columbia and a southern branch kind of coming here weekly into Mexico. We're going to come back to this and use it to forecast here in just a few moments because if you can understand the pattern and flow of the jet stream, you can do a lot to not only improve your near-term but your long-term prediction. Now, thinking about this, I'd like to tell you a quick story, and my story goes back to World War II. In World War II, at the beginning of the war, the major U.S. bomber aircraft was the B-17, and it was a beast. They called it the Fortress. You can see here kind of the outline of that particular plane. But in secret development, and this cost billions of dollars to build, we created this, the Super Fortress, the B-29 bomber. It was faster double the size, double the horsepower, could carry double the payload, and here was the most critical thing. It could fly twice as far. This was the great equalizer in the newly formed Air Force for the United States military. Now, why am I talking about World War II era aircraft? Well, it has to do with this. You see, this is what the jet stream looks like, again, today. It's screaming west to east. We call this zonal flow coming across parts of Asia, really coming across Japan. And the United States overtook some small islands right here and set up military bases, primarily for the Air Force. And to basically retaliate against Japan's bombing of Pearl Harbor, we entered the war against Japan with our Air Force, newly formed Air Force, and this was our plan. We were going to fly this route which meant we were going to fly north, curl to the northern side of Japan, going like north of Mount Fuji, come over here, make the turn, and come back through and try to bomb a lot of central Japan, mainly hitting where they were producing their aircraft. This included a lot of Tokyo. But how the bombing went looked something like this. We flew in at low altitude, unbeknownst to us, under the jet stream. We then climbed once we got past this part of Japan up to about 30,000 feet, made a hard turn to do some incendiary bombing at about 30,000 feet. You see, the idea was if you took the super fortress up to 30,000 feet, no enemy weapon from below could reach it, and it could drop the bombs and get back home as fast as possibly could. Well, as you can imagine, our attempts to do this were thwarted by the winds in the background because this is amazing. Through the beginning of World War II, we didn't even know that that particular feature, the jet stream, really existed. We theorized about it, but we discovered that one of the reasons why we were so terrible at hitting our targets was because the aircraft were being pushed by winds that sometimes could get as high as, well, 200 plus miles an hour. When they would fly into it, their plane could actually be moving 
backwards with respect to a ground speed because the aircraft weren't even fast enough to fly through it. But they couldn't hit their bombs because of the problem. So they fired the guy that was in charge of the Air Force and hired this guy. His name is General Curtis LeMay, and he was the, you know, the new general of now the newly formed Air Force. And you know what he said? He's like, all right, if your planes are getting pushed around by the winds, let's get a bunch of these guys to come out there and figure out what's going on. And those are the meteorologists. And the way that they could assess and understand those winds was they launched weather balloons. Sometimes they just simply tracked the weather balloons as they ascended. Other times they connected them to instrument packs that radioed back information. But the idea was simple. Send this thing up, understand the winds, make a recommendation. And as you can see at the top, their recommendation, fly at night, fly low, and stay out of the jet stream. And General LeMay said, all right, that's how we're going to do this. And we didn't miss a target after that. You see, discovering the position and strength and movement of the jet stream was mission critical to our success in this war. And it is also mission critical for us to understand and forecast, well, any weather at any time scale. So this is the jet stream, and this is ultimately tr what we're trying to predict and understand how it's going to behave. By the way, if I just go back there, see how the jet stream carries the wind all the way across the Pacific? Do you know the Japanese use the jet stream against us as well. They put their own incendiary bombs on balloons, threw them up into the jet stream. They moved across the Pacific Ocean and everywhere they see a red dot here from Western Canada into the Western United States is a place where we found fragments of these, of these bombs. They were highly ineffectual. In fact, sometimes the jet stream sent the winds right back to Japan and a few of the bombs fell on the Northern Islands here. But anyways, amazing bit of story here about our discovery of the jet stream. Now, why do this? Where are we taking it? Well, our jet stream is a part of a global circulation. You know, near the equator, we have the trade winds. They're near the surface, and they move out of the east and toward the west. But across the U.S. and Canada, we're primarily dominated by the westerlies. So the winds shift direction. These global weather patterns shift directions. And here's my job in a nutshell. I am trying to figure out where things deviate from their average position. Because if I can do that, I can understand how the weather is going to change. What makes it complicated is the, the geography of the world, especially across the United States and Canada, where we have this massive mountain chain here called just generally the Rocky Mountains, right, that run all the way from really Central America. In fact, they extend down to the Andes down here, this one massive mountain chain disrupting the flow of the atmosphere. And this is what I'm looking for. If it's summer, it's all about the summer block. Will it be an omega pattern, which looks like the Greek letter omega? Or will it be just a big summer block where we have this trough in the Gulf of Alaska and a weak flow going across Canada toward the Hudson Bay with a big ridge sitting over the Midwestern part of the United States? Or you get a Rex block that's named after a man named Rex who discovered this what we call high over low pattern. You see, this is ultimately the key. And I'm going to talk to you about that Rex block because that's what we had last summer. So June 28th, 2021, when British Columbia and Alberta were just scorched, they were all underneath this big ridge. And the word block tells you what it was doing. It wasn't moving. You see, the more the jet stream goes north-south, the less it progresses west to east. And when that ridge set up, well, we had problems throughout the Canadian prairie. A picture here on the left from Alberta in 2020 versus 2021 shows us how far from normal the rains were. In fact, take a look at this. When you look at the whole of the Canadian prairie, and I'm going all the way from Alberta clear to Lake Winnipeg in this particular example, looking at the precipitation April to October, well, these are the data from 1950 to 2021. You can see that over that time period, the blue dashed line is a linear trend. We're actually increasing on average, our total precipitation during our growing season. How much? About 50 millimeters. But this past summer was the driest we saw since 1979, and before that, 1967. And it was all due to that massive ridge. Now, as a consequence of that, take a look at this satellite animation. This was, again, at the end of June. We can see the fires that broke out in the west under that heat. 
You can even see the, the thickness of the smoke here from those fires in British Columbia and parts of Alberta. It was burning to the south of there as well. This animation shows the western United States and the extent of the smoke from the fires as we went through the month of July. We were monitoring all of it. This is an animation here of um, wildfire smoke and its optical thickness. We ended up discovering that throughout the growing season this past year, mainly from the Midwest through the Canadian Prairie, there was up to a 15% reduction in direct sunlight due to all of the smoke, and it's something we're actively studying at Nutrien. But the net effect of that ridge was to rob us of a lot of precipitation. And what you're looking at here is total precipitation June 1st to September 1st. I'm going to remove everywhere that had more than 120 millimeters of rainfall during that time period. So you can see extensive parts of British Columbia into parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan, especially the southern part of both of those provinces here. Many locations saw well less than 120 millimeters of rainfall. Now, all of that broke in October. A huge pattern shift started to bring deep cyclones into the western part of North America. And this is just one of them here at the end of October, a powerful and deep cyclone. You might remember this from when the jet stream for about 10 days at the end of November into the beginning of December just targeted British Columbia. You can see the flow coming right in through here. And as it did so, we measured rainfall rates where we were totaling up in some places over 500 millimeters of rainfall in about a seven to eight day time period. But as I looked at this, I could see something important taking shape and it was what was happening right in through this area. I wanna come back and talk to you about that particular region in just a few moments here. Because as we slid on into winter, this was the pattern that initially set up. You see the map you're looking at here shows the December 10th through January 11th temperature anomalies. And we saw some brutally cold air setting up across the prairie early. Now you know how this works. That brutally cold air is already going to be very dry. And as a consequence of this, even though we saw lots of snow, it was snow with very low liquid content in it and very, you know, very light, fluffy, powdery type snow. And it didn't hit everywhere. We'll take a look at some snow maps in a few moments. But throughout the month of January into early February, what we've ended up getting is a big ridge in the flow of the jet stream here, where the jet stream flow came over the top and then dove around this trough that was anchored over the Hudson Bay. So in December, that trough was here. January, it moved. And this northwest flow brings in the clippers, but doesn't bring in the moisture that we want and that we need to get during winter. And as a consequence, I was just looking at some satellite data. This is from February the 7th. And as you look here, you can see there's a large area that extends all the way down into the prairie and plains of the United States where we don't have snow on the ground. Now, the snowpack here in British Columbia, right here in the border between that and Alberta, fantastic. But there's an area in through here that goes into Montana, this whole region that has missed out on a lot of snow. We can see it in this map, although this map doesn't extend as far north as of course I'd like, but this is a big region where if you look at the snow water content, we just don't have any. This bare ground into this area. And that's where we get to our current state of things. We've not seen the drought relief we'd hoped for throughout Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba throughout this winter. Now, the North American Drought Monitor is updated just once a month. And this is the one that was released on January 13th. But we still saw not only is 70% of, of, of the United States still in drought, but a big chunk, most of the Canadian prairie, is still sitting pretty dry. So we've got some big questions to ask as we go into the second half of my talk. Are we going to relieve this? Is this going to change? What should we expect going forward, not only into spring and the rest of winter, but what about into summer? Is there anything about this that gives us a clue moving forward? Well, in the near term, we come back to the jet stream behavior. It's split, and the flow's coming out of the northwest across us. And as a result, through the next 10 days, when you look at precipitation compared to normal, there will be a corridor in through here that does see above average precipitation. Notice where it's missing. See this area in through here? Just to the south of that line, that's going to be drier. That flow coming over the top, running down like this, well, all the weather systems are going to follow it. So what we end up getting is multiple clipper systems rolling through here, bringing in some snow. How much? You know, some places may pick up, you know, several centimeters of it over the next several days coming toward the Great Lakes. But I still see a big ridge in place. 
Now, here's the issue with that ridge. As the flow comes up like this and then over the mountains, you get downslope flow, which gives us what we call compressional warming. So you know this, right? If you live up near these mountains, you know that as the flow comes out of the west over the mountains, it tends to deliver warm and very dry conditions. So the snow that's coming in here that's going to be on this side of it, you can tell here that this is going to be really starved of moisture overall. What gives us the brutally cold air is when the flow comes in and pushes against the mountains like this. That's not what we're getting. We're getting flow like that throughout the next 10 plus days. So does this break down? Does this change? And when should we expect it to change? Well, I can tell you this. It's not going to change because of the polar vortex. You know, some years we're talking, um, as meteorologists are only talking about the polar vortex as if it's the main thing. Well, this year, over here on the left, this is the current position of it. It is very strong. It's sitting right over this part of Greenland and the Canadian archipelago, and it has got a tight, tight grip on the coldest air. A year ago is what you see over here on the right. It was split into two pieces, one piece there and one piece here. It had a big ridge pushing against it in Alaska. And this is what ultimately set us up to deliver that brutal Arctic air throughout February that made its way all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So major shift this year compared to last year. But as we think about where all of this is going and the bigger picture, I got to introduce you to some ocean temperature patterns that are worth discussing. Now, in any long range forecast, okay, any long range forecast, there are really only a handful of weather variables that show statistical significance in correlating with long term weather patterns. I'm talking about anything beyond about 15 to 20 days. That has one of them has to do with ocean temperatures. So what have we got? We've got cold water here. That's part of La Nina. If it was warm there, we'd call that El Nino. We've got cold water here in the Gulf of Alaska coming all the way down to the west coast of, of the United States. We call this branch of cold water with all the warmth that's still here the negative phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And in a few moments, we're going to talk about what's going on out of the Indian Ocean over to the Central Pacific. So those are the three areas I'm watching. Now, La Nina, what goes on? When there is a La Nina, the jet stream tends to be highly variable. See, it goes up to big ridges here and flows just like we're going to be seeing it do over the next 10 days. This is very La Nina-like weather we're getting. But the problem is that we're not getting that colder air in place. We're getting this jet stream pattern a little bit farther this direction. And that subtle difference, you see it? This arrow versus this one. That subtle shift makes this whole area have downslope flow and warmer conditions. But still, this is very much an El, or excuse me, a La Nina-like pattern. Now, when we think about where this is all going to go, our La Nina is done. The long-range forecast suggests that it bottomed out in December with the coldest ocean temperatures, and it's slowly warming with time which means once we get into fully into spring, we'll be in what we call ENSO neutral conditions, so neither El Nino or La Nina. And about 25% of the forecast ensemble members take us into El Nino territory by our next summer. So we have to ask, what in the world does that mean? Well, if we look at all of this, we need to add that to what's going on in the North Pacific, because these two things at work together. So if this is La Nina, this here is part of the negative phase of something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO, as I tried to write it there for you. Now, we've been studying this for a long time, and take a look at this, okay? When we look at this, let's try that again, here we go. We can see that from about 2008 to 2013, the PDO was negative. 14, 15, 16, and 17, it was positive, and then it's back down to negative once again. Now, we've been studying this for a while, and we know what it means. Typically for February and March, we like to back that ridge up here, get the flow to come over the top of it, and then it tends to dive, which means we tend to get colder conditions here if the trough is far enough to the west. Same with the ridge, if it's far enough to the west. So we gotta see if that's gonna occur. Well, the other part of this is that there's another feature, the last one, that comes out of the Indian Ocean. We call it the MJO. The M stands for Madden, the J stands for Julian, and the O stands for Oscillation. Basically, these two guys figured out that somewhere between here and here, there's going to be big storms coming out of the tropics. 
Wherever they sit, that's where we would call the MJO phase. So in this case, it'd be somewhere between phases two and phase three. See it? That's where the big storms are located. Now, what's the point of doing that? Well, it turns out, as I started out this presentation telling you, it's the heat and momentum transport out of the tropics that ultimately governs the position of the jet stream. So we care about the MJO. We know something about it. Now, I like to look at it in these complicated and ugly diagrams you see over here. The MJO is currently coming out between phases two and three, right in that triangle. Now, we've been studying ever since the 1950s where the MJO comes into phase three, what it gives us in terms of a jet stream pattern. It tends to push that ridge back over to Aleutian Islands and give us deeper troughing in this area. So this is all jet stream flow. Now that would suggest we'd get some cooler air if we can move the ridge far to the west. If it fails to move to the west, then we don't get that. We will not get the cold air. But this is where we're potentially taking this pattern moving forward. So what do we end up getting out of all of that? Well, this is the February 25th through March 25th outlook from the European model. And this just came out earlier this week. It's suggesting that the flow is going to do something a bit more like this. Now, what does that mean? If it comes into British Columbia, we're going to see above average precipitation in this area. We'll get clippers that come out of this as well. You're going, but I don't see the green. Well, they're, they're drier, right? The clippers are drier. You can see where the cold air is trying to anchor itself, but the mild conditions you see in through here, a lot of this is due because of the next 10 plus days, we got that downslope flow. So I expect a very highly volatile temperature pattern from now through the end of March. But the good news about this is it's not a dry signal in this area. Dry colors would be like these. So we're seeing the models pick up at least on better chances of seeing more normal precipitation. But normal precipitation won't cure the long-term drought. You understand? It's not going to do that because we need to have excess to work against our drought issues. And don't forget, our soil is frozen. That snow has to be there to melt later this year. So we need to keep building up that snowpack. So we start asking those questions. Well, what about later this year after what's there in the snow begins to melt? So I'm going to take you back to that PDO feature. It's currently negative. We expect it to stay negative. Well, what happens in summer when that occurs? Well, unfortunately, everywhere that you see these warmer colors, there's a correlation with drier conditions. And that means that we're going to have to watch out for this summer to see, does the jet stream pattern end up doing something like this? And here's the number one thing that the Canadian Prairie needs to think about. If the jet stream pattern responds to the drought, especially the drought in the southern plains of the United States, and puts a big ridge right here, we end up getting around this what we call the ring of fire precipitation pattern. And that tends to be very, very stormy throughout the Canadian Prairie. But that requires the ridge I just drew there to be pretty far to the south. If it migrates north or migrates west, well, we can get ourselves into a situation like we saw last year. That's the two scenarios that I'm seeing going forward. So what are the models suggesting? Well, as I stated, February, March, and April, we're going to keep probably the clippers going through this area. What you're about to watch is an animation of a three-month sliding window of precipitation anomalies just released here this week from the European Center. So as I click play on this, let's pause it and go a little bit slower here. March, April, and May, you can see that the model is attempting to keep the drier conditions it started with in place. And what happens to them as we get into April, May, and June, and then May, June, July? You can see that the model is stuck on persistence. See that? It's not allowing for the recovery of moisture in here. What I'm telling you is, watch this area, because if it goes over dry and the ridge sets up there, this won't verify. You'll get more moisture running around the ridge and the periphery of that ridge, giving you that ring of fire precipitation pattern. What we're looking at now, though, is just model output. So we see that June, July, August looks to be wetter the farther east you go. So maybe split it on the 100th meridian. That might be the way that this particular summer is shaping up. But just a reminder, these long-range forecasts are based solely on two things the ocean temperatures, 
and they're based upon the current soil moisture conditions. So that's what's going into this. See how they're perpetuating that? Well, there's other models out there as well. And the one on the left, the NMME, is the March, April, and May forecast. Now, the National Multimodel Ensemble includes two Canadian models in this. And you can see that for this upcoming spring, the model is more aggressive on better precipitation. That's good. That's a good signal. What about May, June, July? Well, it's trying to let the drought creep farther to the north again. So I think this is a situation that we're going to have to watch the pattern evolve through spring before we can make a guess, make an educated guess, a good forecast on what to expect. But that's my job for Nutrient, so I'll be doing that and communicating it to you. Now, as we think about the last couple of minutes here, I just want to come back to this graphic and just show you that these are the main features we're going to be watching moving forward. And they affect the weather elsewhere in the world as well. For example, in South America, take a look over here at the left. This is the last three months. This is a drought indicator we use for South America. And what you can see here is that Brazil's northern growing areas, very wet. Mato Grosso, their biggest producing state for corn and soybeans and cotton, has had a great growing season. It's been too wet east, but to the south, Mato Grosso do Sul through Parna, Rio Grande do Sul, this area, record drought. And the crop has taken a major hit because of that. Now, what do we see going forward? Well, when you look over the next 15 days, southern Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina are going to continue to struggle with moisture. And this is going to continue to impact some big crops that you know are, are, are already tight on the global balance sheet. So we're going to be wetter north where they're actively trying to harvest one crop of soybeans and plant a crop of, um, of, of safrina corn and cotton. And it's a little bit too wet in the east to do that. But drought situation is going to continue to get worse south. And the longer term forecast for March, April, and May, which is the end of the monsoon season, suggests that we could be talking about more than 80% of the land area where we grow crops in South America dealing possibly with moisture stress. And that's a key market story moving forward for just global grains in general. Now from there, in my last minute and a half, I want to give you a quick global update. One thing that's been interesting this winter, and it's showing up again in the next 10-day forecast, is that we've not timed brutal Arctic air here over the eastern part of North America and, whoops, sorry, and across Europe. If those two things line up at all throughout February or March, that could send global heating demand through the roof, which is going to be putting a lot of pressure on the natural gas market. Just something I want you to think about. And as you look at the precipitation patterns over the next uh, 10 days, you can see that much of you know this side, Eastern Russia, or excuse me, Eastern Europe, getting into Western Russia and the wheat belt here, there's better moisture in this area uh, than compared to certain other places around the world. One of those other places I want to take you to in my last couple of moments here is Australia. Now, throughout the beginning of this year, in fact, it goes back in December as well, most of Australia has, had, has seen quite a bit of precipitation. Month or uh, year to date so far, so from January 1st to February 8th, been very wet in through here. And one major topic of discussion right now is down in South Australia, right down here, there was a major rainstorm that has cut off a town which blocks the north-south transport of goods out of that area. And that's really affecting a lot of different markets in Australia. But the root zone soy moisture tells you how wet things have been. About the only places I can find that have been drier than normal that are key growing areas are this part of Queensland and over here in um, you know Western Australia where you can see some areas are struggling with some lower root zone soil moisture. Now my last 30 seconds I'm just going to give you one last thing to think about. Remember back in mid-January when that massive volcano erupted here the Tonga eruption this is the bathymetry of it. Well we were watching on satellite that eruption and it was impressive. It sent ash and soot and debris 55,000 feet into the sky. But I'm going to tell you something. We've been observing volcanoes for a long time. And what we care most about is how much sulfur dioxide they put into the stratosphere. Like Pinatubo put 20 million metric tons. And you say, why do you care about that? Well, sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere causes the stratosphere to warm. While the troposphere, the layer we live in, tends to cool. So the question is, did this volcano put a lot up there? Well, initially, it looked as though it did, but this was a relatively small plume just a few days after the eruption. It was over this part of Australia. 
Since then, that sulfur dioxide plume has largely been washed out. And what initially started here and got caught in the prevailing winds, which are out of the east there, came over here into the Indian Ocean, and this is all we measured a week later. And if you're going, well, that doesn't look like much, well, that's the point. There's not much. This volcanic eruption, while terrifying and impressive, will not have a global impact on temperatures and our climate system as we move forward. So that was a lot to cover here in 30 minutes, but I hope you found this informative and useful, covered a lot of different geographies, and got an idea about the spring or summer. I appreciate the attention, and I look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Thanks.